Greetings from the voice of Alan Kardec. And welcome from the voice of the spirits. We're here once again to take you on another audio journey through the Spirits book by Alan Kardec. On today's journey, we will continue with the conclusion. Enjoy. Enjoy. Section 3. You have stated that you would like to cure your century of a craze that threatens to invade the world. Would you rather the world be invaded by the disbelief you seek to propagate? Is it not to the absence of belief that we ought to attribute the relaxing of family ties and the majority of the disorders that are controlling society? By demonstrating the existence and immortality of the soul, Spiritism revives faith in the future, uplifts discouraged hearts, and enables us to bear the tribulations of life with resignation. Would you dare call this an evil? Two doctrines confront each other. One denies the future, the other proclaims and proves it. One explains nothing, the other explains everything. And in doing so, it appeals to reason. One sanctions selfishness, the other offers a basis for justice, charity, and the love of one's neighbor. The former affirms only the present and erases all hope. The latter consoles and shows the vast field of the future. Which of the two is the more pernicious? Certain individuals, among the most skeptical, present themselves as apostles of fraternity and progress. However, true fraternity implies selflessness and the renunciation of self-centeredness. The sentiment of pride is an anomaly to true fraternity. By what right do you impose a sacrifice on those to whom you state that at death everything will be over for them, and that perhaps tomorrow they will be nothing more than an old worn out and discarded machine? What reason would they have to impose any privation on themselves? Is it not more natural that in the few moments granted to them they would try to live as well as possible? This gives rise to the desire to possess more and more in order to enjoy life better. It also gives birth to jealousy of those who possess even more. And from such jealousy to the desire to rob and steal, there is only a single step. What is there to prevent this? The law? Unfortunately, the law does not cover all cases. Would you say it is conscience, a sense of duty? But upon what do you base this sense of duty? Can its reason for existing be found in the belief that everything ends with life? According to this belief, only one maxim is rational, every man for himself. The ideas of fraternity, conscience, duty, humanity, and progress are no more than empty words. You who proclaim similar doctrines, you do not know all the evil you cause society or how many crimes you are responsible for. But why do I speak of responsibility at all? There is no such thing for skeptics. They only render homage to matter. Section 4. The progress of humankind has as its principle the practical application of the law of justice, love, and charity. And this law is founded on the certainty of the future. Take away that certainty and you take away its cornerstone. All others are derived from this law because it entails all the conditions of human happiness. It alone can heal the afflictions of society, and we can judge this by comparing various eras and peoples, since their conditions improve as this law is better understood and better applied. In addition, if a partial and incomplete application has produced such a real benefit, what would happen if all social institutions were to take it as their basis? Could that be possible? Yes. Those who have advanced 10 steps can advance 20, and so on. We can evaluate the future based on the past. We are already seeing that the hostilities among peoples are decreasing a little by little, that the barriers separating them fall as they become civilized, that they are joining hands from one end of the world to the other, that more justice is presiding over international laws, that wars are becoming rarer and no longer exclude humane sentiments, that uniformity is being established in relationships that race and caste distinctions are disappearing and people of different beliefs are silencing their sectarian prejudices so that they may unite in the worship of one and the same God. We are speaking of the peoples that are at the forefront of civilization. 
refer to questions 789 to 793. From every aspect, however, we are still far from perfection, and there is still much old residue to destroy before the last vestiges of barbarity disappear. But will those vestiges be able to withstand the irresistible power of progress and that living force which in itself is a law of nature? If the present generation is more advanced than the last, why should the next not be more advanced than ours? It will in fact be so through the force of things. First, because with each generation a few champions of the old abuses die out every day, and thus society is increasingly composed of new members who are free of the old prejudices. Second, because humans desire progress, they study the obstacles and employ their efforts to overcome them. Evolution is incontestable, and future progress cannot be put in doubt. People by nature desire to be happy, and they only seek progress to increase their happiness. Apart from happiness, progress would have no objective. What would be the value of progress for them if the goal was not to improve their conditions? Even so, after having obtained the happiness that intellectual progress can offer them, they will perceive that such happiness is not complete. They will realize that such happiness is impossible without the security and harmony in social relationships that can be found only in moral progress. Thus, by the force of circumstances, they themselves will drive progress along the path of morality, and spiritism will offer them the most powerful means of reaching the goal. Section 5 Those who state that spiritist beliefs are threatening to invade the world, thereby proclaim its power. For an idea without foundation and lacking in logic could not become universal. If spiritism is putting down roots everywhere, recruiting especially from the enlightened classes, as has been widely acknowledged, it is because it is founded upon truth. All the efforts of its detractors will be useless, proving that, far from deterring its impulse, the very ridicule which they have sought to heap upon it seems to have given it new vigor. This result fully justifies what the spirits have stated. Do not allow yourselves to be disquieted by opposition. Everything they do against you will turn to your advantage, and your greatest adversaries will serve your cause in spite of themselves. Against the will of God, the ill will of human beings shall not prevail. With spiritism, humankind must enter a new phase, moral progress, which is spiritism's inevitable consequence. So stop wondering at the speed at which spiritist ideas are spreading due to the satisfaction they provide to all those who delve into them and who see in them something more than a wasteful pastime. Since men and women desire happiness above everything else, it is no wonder they become interested in an idea that makes them happy. The development of these ideas presents three distinct periods. The first is that of curiosity aroused by the strangeness of the phenomena. The second is that of reasoning and philosophy. The third is that of application and consequences. The period of curiosity has already passed. Contrary to what serious thought or reason infer, curiosity only lasts for a certain amount of time and once satisfied, it passes on to something new. But the same does not occur with what is referred to as serious thought or reason. The second period has already begun, and the third will certainly follow. Spiritism has especially progressed since it has become better understood in its essential nature, and its reach has been acknowledged to touch the most sensitive fiber of humankind, happiness, even in this world. This is the cause of its spread, the secret of the power that is enabling it to triumph. Its influence has not yet extended over the masses, but it has already rendered happy those who have come to understand it. Even those who have not witnessed any of the physical phenomena of the manifestations will state, apart from the phenomena, spiritist philosophy explains to me what no other has ever explained. Through simple reasoning, I find in it a rational explanation of the problems that interest me the most, those of my future. It provides me with peace, security, and confidence. It frees me from the torments of uncertainty, rendering the material aspects of life secondary. As for those who assail spiritism, I respond, would you like to fight against it successfully? If so, simply replace it with something better. Find a more philosophical solution to all the problems it resolves. Give people another certainty that will render them happier. However, you must thoroughly understand the reach of that word certainty because people only accept as certain what appears to be logical. 
Do not think it is enough to state that something does not exist. Denying something is too easy. Go beyond simple denial and prove through solid facts that it is not viable, never has been, and never can be. And in such a case, state clearly what you would put in its place. Furthermore, prove that spiritism has not rendered humans better and therefore happier by encouraging the purest gospel-oriented morality, a morality that is very much praised but very little practiced. When you have done all this, you will have a right to assail it. Spiritism is powerful because it is supported on the very basis of religion itself. God, the soul, future rewards and punishments, and especially because it shows such rewards and punishments to be the natural consequences of earthly life. The picture it paints of the future contains nothing that can be contested by the most demanding reason. You, whose doctrine consists entirely of denying the future, what compensation do you offer for the suffering found in this world? You uphold yourselves on disbelief, whereas spiritism supports itself on trust in God. It invites everyone to happiness, to hope, to true fraternity, whereas you offer them nothingness as a prospect and selfishness as a consolation. Spiritism explains everything. You explain nothing. It proves by facts. You prove nothing. Why would you expect people to hesitate between these two doctrines? Section 6. It would be quite erroneous to believe that the power of spiritism derives from the practice of material manifestations, and that, therefore, by hampering them, one could undermine its foundations. However, its power is in its philosophy, in the appeal it makes to reason and common sense. In antiquity, it was the object of mysterious study, carefully hidden from the common folk. Today, it holds no secrets from anyone, and it speaks a clear language without ambiguity. There is neither mysticism in it, nor any allegories prone to erroneous interpretation. It wishes to be understood by all, because the time has come to enable humankind to know the truth. Far from opposing the diffusion of the light, it desires light for all. It does not demand blind faith, but wants everyone to know why they believe, and since it is based on reason, it will always be more powerful than doctrines based on nothingness. Could the obstacles that have been set up against the free expression of spirit manifestations silence them? No, such obstacles would have the effect of all other prohibitions, that of exciting curiosity and the desire to investigate what is being prohibited. On the other hand, if spirit manifestations were the personal privilege of only a single individual, no one would doubt that if that individual were out of the way, the manifestations would cease. Unfortunately for our adversaries, the manifestations are within everybody's reach and are being utilized by all, from the least to the greatest, from the palace to the hovel. It might be possible to prevent them from being produced in public, but it is well known that they are more effectively produced not in public but in private. In addition, since all persons are mediums in one way or another, how would it be possible to prevent family members in their own home individuals in the silence of their bedroom, or prisoners in their cell, and in the presence of their executioners, from having communications with the spirits around them. If mediums were forbidden in one country, could they be hindered in neighboring countries or in the entire world, since there is not a single region in the two halves of the world in which there are no mediums? In order to imprison all the mediums, it would be necessary to detain half the human race. If it were possible to burn all the spiritist books, not an easy task, they would be reproduced the next day because their source cannot be stricken, and because one could never imprison or burn the spirits, their true authors. Spiritism is not the work of any one individual. No one can claim to be its author, for it is as old as creation itself. It is found everywhere in all religions, especially in Catholicism, where, in actuality, it has more authority than in all the others. Catholicism contains the principles of all the manifestations, spirits of every degree, their secret or patent relationships with humankind, guardian angels, reincarnation, the emancipation of the soul during life, second sight, visions, manifestations of every kind, and even tangible apparitions. As for depictions of demons, they are no more than evil spirits, and except for the belief that demons have turned to wickedness forever, whereas evil spirits have the path of progress open before them, 
There is no other difference but the name. So what does the modern spiritist science do? It joins into a whole what has been scattered. It explains in its own terms what has only been known in allegorical language, and it eliminates everything that superstition and ignorance have created, leaving only what is real and positive. This is its role. But the role of founder does not belong to it. It reveals what already exists. It coordinates but creates nothing, for its foundations may be found in all ages and places. Who would thus dare feel strong enough to stifle it by sarcasm or even by persecution? If it were proscribed in one place, it would reappear in others exactly as it has been when it was banned because it exists in nature itself, and humans have not given the ability to obliterate a power of nature or veto the decrees of God. Furthermore, what interest would there be in hampering the publication of spiritist ideas? It is true that such ideas have arisen against the abuses that spring from pride and selfishness, but these abuses, which are profitable to some, injure the masses. Spiritism will therefore have the masses on its side and will have no serious adversaries except those interested in maintaining such abuses. Instead, under its influence, its ideas will render people better towards one another, less avid about material interest, and more resigned before the decrees of providence thus guaranteeing order and tranquility.